Hello friends, I am Dr. Ajay Handa and this is Dr. Srinivas from Coimbatore. We have both uh, come to attend this PAX 2018 at uh, New Delhi and it's uh, today's uh, topic which we have a session on diffuse alveolar hemorrhages, the challenges and the diagnosis of this uh, difficult condition. So we are here to discuss a few key points, uh, what we want you to all take away as learning points for this session which we had. So as you all know, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage is a, a serious condition. It has got a, a distinct clinical pathological entity with uh, the main conditions causing this entity being uh, primary pulmonary vasculitis, that is ANCA associated vasculitis, namely granulomatosis, polyangitis and microscopic polyangitis and uh, uh, SLE associated diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And anti glomerular basement membrane disease related diffuse alveolar hemorrhage all these uh, diseases put together would account for about 80 to 90 percent of cases presenting with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage in our uh, clinical scenario however there are a lot of conditions in the tropics which uh, could come with a presentation like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage so called the mimics of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and I have uh, Dr. Srinivas who has a original research in this field and I would like him to enlighten the audience about that over to you Yes, as rightly said, uh, in the tropics, several infectious diseases, especially leptospirosis, scrub typhus, dengue, can present with alveolar hemorrhage per se. So it's very important to one, make a diagnosis of alveolar hemorrhage very quickly because it's a life-threatening condition. Second, it's important to differentiate the infectious causes from vasculitis because the treatment is totally different for both of these conditions. So we looked at over one year prospectively how many of patients we had in our ICU with presentation with alveolar hemorrhage and renal disease, so-called pulmonary renal syndrome. So we had 1325 admissions over one year. Out of these, actually 180 patients had acute renal failure requiring dialysis or acute renal failure per se. Now, of these patients, only 27 actually fulfill criteria for pulmonary renal syndrome. Now, out of, out of these 27 patients, only 13 had vasculitis. So, what it tells us is, this is not a common condition, it's a fairly rare condition and every other patient will have a pulmonary renal syndrome mimic. So, it's very important to keep that open in mind. And if you look at what are the distribution of causes, a series from Bombay suggests that anchor related vasculitis is the most common cause of alveolar hemorrhage. In our own series, SLE was the most common cause followed by anchor associated vasculitis. So it's important at this stage to really make the distinction of very quickly the diagnosis of alveolar hemorrhage and secondly what is the cause of others. For the first step, do you, Dr. Handa would you like to? Okay, so uh, like he said that the diagnosis has to be made in an urgent and an emergent manner because the delay in the diagnosis in vasculitis would be associated with poor outcomes and a very high mortality. So it's a classical presentation which would which would make you think that this is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage related to vasculitis. The patient would have acute to subacute onset of symptoms of breathlessness, a fresh infiltrate on the x-ray which could be either symmetrical or asymmetrical and a drop in hemoglobin or hematocrit which is the most difficult to establish because many a patients may have pre-existing anemia. So if a patient has hemoptysis with fresh infiltrates and anemia or a drop in hematocrit, that situation is a very very clear indicator that you are possibly dealing with a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndrome. If in situations where there is no clear cut drop in hemoglobin or you cannot demonstrate a drop in hemoglobin and the patient does not have hemoptysis, then to establish the diagnosis one would like to do a bronchoscopy wherein you would be able to demonstrate a bloody bowel that is blood stained fluid coming out and the blood appearance of the bloody bowel keeps on increasing from the first to the third aliquot of the bowel taken from the same segment. In addition, when you put up these uh, bowel samples for uh, staining for hemosiderin, the macrophages would have hemosiderin laden macrophages in more than 20% of cases which makes the situation diagnostic. It is extremely rare that you would require to do any further procedure to confirm the diagnosis because many of these patients are sick, they are hypoxemic and the other procedures like a bronchoscopic lung biopsy and a surgical lung biopsy would be extremely difficult to perform. So it would be imperative to follow on the serological test like the ANCA as uh, Srinivas brought out, ANCA, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody and ANA that is anti-nuclear antibody both by the ELISA and the uh, indirect immunofluorescence assay would give you the diagnosis in almost 80% of cases. Now having diagnosed the patient, what is the line of treatment you would follow, how aggressively you would like to manage, I would like to ask Srinivas to comment upon. 
right as has been uh, like we have now clearly seen how to diagnose diffuse alveolar hemorrhage simultaneously we have started the investigation for what is the etiology of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage so if you are suspecting pulmonary renal syndrome due to mimics infectious mimics what are the clinical features which can suggest mimics so presence of fever especially high grade fever a very short duration took before presentation to the hospital this should actually alert you or if the season if there is a you know infectious disease season going on in the appropriate context this should alert you to the possibility of infectious causes and you should evaluate accordingly because several causes can cause so you should look for lepta malaria scrub typhus and hanton virus like syndromes can cause this kind of syndrome if not the diagnosis is made by serological test as we already brought out we almost never do biopsies we almost never do lung biopsies to diagnose diffuse alveolar hemorrhage sometimes we do kidney biopsies if there is a concurrent renal involvement if the patient is stable enough to undergo renal biopsy and if the anca is negative so in our own series uh, of 27 patients actually only one in six patients actually required some sort of biopsy and we often performed either a skin biopsy or a kidney biopsy to test establish the diagnosis so having now established this diagnosis very quickly so usually we try and establish the diagnosis this is by 48 hours and if the patient is sick enough we start treatment with whatever seems most likely often we try and cover both if it is not very clear so once we have diagnosed the entity as hand car related vasculitis which is the most common thing then there are two steps to management first is induction that is you want the patient to be in remission that is similar to what we call for treatment for malignancies so patient has to be free of the disease initially second the disease should not come back so you want the patient to be in remission and second phase is the maintenance treatment so the induction regimen uh, classically used to be oral cyclophosphamide now oral cyclophosphamide is cumulative so it causes lot of toxicity over the long term so then people moved on to parenteral iv pulse cyclophosphamide so this used this is was the standard by a trial called the cyclops trial so this was a new standard iv cyclophosphamide works faster than oral cyclophosphamide and is associated with half the dose of oral cyclophosphamide so definitely it has lesser toxicity but again it over the long term the cumulative thing causes over decades later secondary malignancy is hypogonadism and this is especially problematic in young people so there is increasing interest towards use of rituximab as a induction agent so there are two large trials which are actually complementary to each other called the rave trial and the rituximab trial published in NEJM and they kind of in, uh, enrolled patients who are complementary to each other the rave trial in, enrolled patients who are not very sick but who actually needed induction they enrolled both new and old patients with relapsed and associated vasculitis none of these patients actually had needed dialysis that was an exclusion criteria actually one third had mild diffuse alveolar hemorrhage any severe diffuse alveolar hemorrhage was excluded for in this trial rituxi was enrolled the opposite end of the spectrum very severe renal disease requiring dialysis actually so actually one one in three patients in the rituxi was trial required plasmapheresis so uh, and both of these trials suggested that rituximab is as good as cyclophosphamide to uh, induce the patients in remission with this protocol roughly 60 to 70% of patients will be in remission and at a low dose of steroids by 6 months so this is the current induction strategy the earlier other induction strategies which have been tried include induction with methotrexate induction with mycophenolate now none of this is applicable to sick patients with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage that will be contraindicated so the real choice is actually between cyclophosphamide and rituximab either one is appropriate rituximab is definitely indicated in two situations one is a young person who is planning family and second is especially if they have relapsed disease this is a must indication for rituximab everything else would depend on who is managing the patient next part of the therapy would be <clears throat> to achieve maintenance with the continuation of immunosuppressive medication because otherwise they have a very high incidence of relapse almost 30% of them would relapse and maybe up to 60% would relapse in the longer term so the maintenance therapy there are various number of drugs used but the drug which has stayed the test of time over the period of time is azathioprine along oral azathioprine along with low dose oral steroid the point i'm making here is along with agents like cyclophosphamide and rituximab there is profound immunosuppression and the steroid is at about 5 to 6 month should be down to a dose of about 7.5 mg so thereafter the dose could be about a 5 mg dose but steroid in low dose along with azathioprine as shown in the main 
recommended sand trial was able to maintain a very low relapse rate and the medications were continued for almost 24 months so two drug combination that is azathioprine and oral steroid in low dose given for a period of 18 to 24 months was able to ensure this period as certain more trials which shrinivas will throw a light upon may as you know evidence is available uh, towards the shorter taper of steroid and a longer duration of maintenance therapy the maintenance may even go up to 3 to 4 years the trials are ongoing back to shrinivas right so there are two components to treatment maintenance treatment one is you initially pulse these patients with steroids then you put them on oral steroids after three days so one gram over three days then you put them on oral prednisolone traditionally one milligram per kg for the first week then then you taper so that is the steroid component second is the immunosuppression we've already induced either with cyclosmide or rituximab so traditionally people who are induced with cyclosmide were then shifted when they were in remission to azathioprine and like dr handa has told us azathioprine was typically continued for 18 to 24 months usually 18 months Increasingly, there is a trend to give them to 24 months. Now, the paradigm shift after rituximab came as an agent for induction was to continue rituximab. And what is the reason to continuing rituximab is that long-term follow-up of the Sizerin trial, which is the pivotal trial for azathioprine in maintenance therapy, suggested that there is a very high rates of relapse with continuing azathioprine at 10 years. And the rates remained as high as 40 to 60 percent uh, during long-term follow-up. So, rituximab was seen as a new method and in, the, in this context, this main Ritson trial came up. What they did was they enrolled patients who were in remission with either cyclosmide or rituximab and then gave them 500 mg every six monthly till two years. And they found the least relapse rate of 6% till date in any ANCA-related vasculitis at the end of two years. However, on following of these patients to three years, 36 months, they found again the relapse rates were pretty high. That is, once these patients were off rituximab, they were relapsing. So there's an increasing interest in continuing the therapy till at least five years. So dosing rituximab beyond till four to five years is the current paradigm. And a new trial called the main Ritzan 2 trial and the main Ritzan 3 trial is actually looking at this. There is also a, another trial showing that continuing azathioprine to five years also reduces the lab site significantly compared to stopping at 24 months. So the paradigm is now changing from two years to five years. Now, do we have to hit everybody with rituximab or do you have to select patients? Are there, is there anything to suggest some patients will relapse more than the other? There is some evidence that repopulation with CD19 positive cells or a flare in ANCA titer is associated with the higher rate of relapse. So this main Ritzan trial which I already talked about is trying to focus these patients. So anybody with these two conditions is given rituximab. If they don't have, then rituximab is held. So that is a new paradigm, a flowchart based management for ANCA related vasculitis. This results of which are eagerly awaited. So at the moment, however, if you induce the patient with cyclovasmate, you're perfectly all right continuing azathioprine till at least you know two to two years reassessing the patient if you feel that this patient is absolutely fine maybe put this patient off if not if there is any suspicion then continue especially if they have relapsed continue this patient till at least four to five years if they are on rituximab follow the protocol of the main Ritzan trial but keep the immunosuppression on till four to five years so that is how all of these patients should receive appropriate prophylaxis for pcp should also receive any uh, prophylaxis for you know osteoporosis and uh, what is the protocol for steroids we generally taper the steroids should 10 milligram at the end of three months and then five milligram to the end of six months so this is the usual protocol and we keep the steroids usually going on till the time we continue the immunosuppression so that is how we would manage this patient so overall it's important that these patients are managed by uh, specialists who have experience in managing such patients so any of you who are you know uh, having a diagnosis and haven't treated it would be worthwhile you know referring them to a center where there are patients uh, doctors are experienced in managing these centers uh, these patients because a patient who refractory to medication may need certain other modalities of treatment like plasma exchange and uh, possibly even in certain situations they may require extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Now to the milder cases who could have lesser degree of disease activity based on the vascularitis disease activity index you could also use agents like oral methotrexate, mycophenolate except if there is you know serious cardiac neurological renal and respiratory involvement. So it's got a limited disease limited to the airways. So that's all in a nutshell about the entire uh, session that we had. And uh, thanks to my uh, co-colleague uh, uh, on the thing, Dr. Srinivas, I am Dr. Ajay Handa signing off. Thank you.